In Washington state, a beautiful young woman is found savagely murdered. There was bruising on her face, and there was bruising around the neck where she'd been strangled. It's a horrific incident. I was heartbroken. I mean, I was genuinely heartbroken. A confusing trail of clues leads to the man they believe is guilty. He was the only person possible that could have murdered her. But without enough evidence to lay charges, the case goes cold. Can two determined cops now prevent the remorseless killer from walking free? I'll never give up on a case, and I'll hunt you down to the end. Just outside Seattle lies the town of Kirkland, a picturesque community on the shores of Lake Washington. It's home to 27-year-old Elena Busiakos. She was beautiful, very Greek. Her smile was really captivating. When she spoke with you, she would speak to you, not at you. You know, she would draw you in. She was just a very stunning girl, very sweet. She was as beautiful inside as she was on the outside. On New Year's Eve, 1998, Elena has just one wish for the year ahead. We all wrote down what our hopes and dreams for that year was going to be. And so she wrote down that she was ready to meet her soulmates. She was ready to meet somebody that would cherish her and love her. Elena has had lots of suitors. But since her divorce, her main man has been Anthony, her seven-year-old son. She glowed when she was with him. She, she was a good mom very good mom. Her life revolved around Anthony. She wanted somebody that treated him good, and she wanted a traditional family. Just weeks after making her wish, Elena connects with a handsome man at the gym. She just told me she met somebody, and she was in love. In love with a charismatic Sione Louis. I'd never seen her ever that completely enamored. He was very good with Anthony. That was very important to her. It wasn't just her as Sione, it was about her Sione and Anthony. A year into their relationship, Sione presents Elena with an engagement ring. You know, they'd been working towards getting engaged, so it wasn't a big surprise. In January of 2001, the couple moves to the nearby town of Woodenville to create their first home together. I liked him. I liked her together with him. They seemed very happy, and they did. They seemed really happy. But on Friday, February 2nd, just weeks before their wedding, the lives of Elena and Sione are changed forever. In the late afternoon, Elena meets up with her ex-husband in a downtown parking lot to drop off Anthony. They shared custody. She had him during the week, and then she would drop him off on the weekends. As night falls, Elena hurries home to pack for a weekend in California. That Saturday morning, she was going down to see her mom. But Elena's mother is sadly disappointed. Plane loads of travelers pass through the airport. Elena, however, is not among them. Sione contacts Elena's friends, but no one has seen her. It didn't seem like she had just got up and went missing or, you know, ran off. She wasn't that type of personality. On Monday, Elena fails to show up at work and doesn't pick up Anthony after school. She would never leave her son, ever. She would never not show up for work. She would never not call her mom if she wasn't going to get on the airplane. Certain something is wrong. Sione reaches out to the King County Sheriff's Department. She hasn't called me. She hasn't called her mom. And I've just been talking to her mom over and over, and then she's worried. I'm worried. Detective Sue Peters is alerted. Sione had reported he last saw her as they were getting ready for bed on Friday night. And the next morning, he was still asleep 
and she left what she assumed was to go to the airport. Detectives move into high gear. Then they were researching with the airlines, and it turns out she had not boarded an aircraft to California. Police mount an all-out search in the Seattle area. We need to find her. Sioni actually took it upon himself to coordinate looking for Elena. We were passing out her flyers everywhere we could think about. Maybe somebody knows something, maybe somebody saw something that night. Sioni actually put together a group of friends, rugby players, and searched the area of I-5 all the way to the airport, trying to locate her or her car. But seven days later, there is still no sign of Elena. What awful fate has befallen Elena Busiakos? I think we all knew in our gut that something horrific had happened and that it was going to be a sad story. Seven days after 27-year-old Elena Busiakos goes missing, investigators are running out of leads. None of her close circle of friends had had any contact with her. Her car hadn't been located, so there's a possibility of foul play. Prosecutor Kristen Richardson is at home when she gets the late night phone call. They said something to the effect of, we have bad news, we found the woman who's been missing from Woodenville. Her vehicle had in fact been recovered a mile, mile and a half from her home. And it was parked at an athletic club. The vehicle was unoccupied. We wanted to get into the trunk immediately. They opened the trunk lid. Investigators are horrified to discover the lifeless body of Elena Busiakos. She almost was in a fetal position on one side. Her body was well preserved due to the coldness in Seattle. It was as if she was asleep. She was in perfect condition. But on closer examination, we could see markings around the neck already. The medical examiner's office advised detectives that she had been strangled. A young mother fiance and friend murdered. But why? Investigators hope the crime scene will provide some clues. There were some items in the vehicle that could appear that she was on her way to the airport, such as a suitcase. But the clothes she's wearing may tell a different story. Here, this beautiful girl was on her way to the airport. And from what I gathered, she dressed to the tins and she did not look like she was on her way to the airport. She had her tennis shoes on, her sweatshirt, her pants. And on the passenger front seat, there was a stack of clothing items. Maybe she was gonna stop somewhere and change, or even change at the airport. But Elena never made it that far. She could have stopped to get something at a store, and someone, I suppose, could have snatched her and killed her and put her in the car. Murdered in the course of a robbery, perhaps. The driver's door was unlocked. There were no keys in the ignition. I didn't find a purse in the vehicle. Her diamond ring was not on her finger. It was gone. Potential that someone robbed her and killed her and panicked and didn't know what to do with her body and put it in the car. Detectives head to Elena's home to break the horrifying news to Sioni. His family is by his side. His sister had flown in from Hawaii. He called his sister and said, I need you to come be here with me. I can't handle this alone. Grief struck, Sioni willingly accompanies police to the station to aid in their investigation. It's typical anyone close to Elena, especially the boyfriend living with her. How would you describe your relationship with Elena? We are highly in love. Their wedding planned for the following week on Valentine's Day. We're looking at going to Hawaii because my sister lives in Hawaii. Elena did not have a ring on when her body was recovered. And so Sioni was questioned about that. Did she leave her ring at home? Sioni is certain Elena was wearing it. Could the killer have stolen the ring? At the end of the long night, Sioni takes a routine polygraph to verify his statements. The results of that test were inconclusive. And the examiner believed, since he hadn't slept during that time period, that that's why the results were inconclusive. The next day, Sioni opens his home to the police so they can gather evidence. 
You know, it didn't appear there was a sign of a fight or a struggle. We looked for jewelry items, and her ring was never found during the search. What police do find are signs of Sione's desperate search for the woman he loves. We recovered documents such as the grid pattern that Sione had established to search areas of King County. Police turn their focus to another man in Elena's life, her ex-husband, a former gang member. The original detectives spoke with him at length. He'd had recent contact with her. Elena had dropped off their son on that Friday evening. Had the pair fought, perhaps over custody? And where was her ex later that night when Elena was killed? They polygraphed Elena's husband, her ex-husband. He was home with Elena's son during the nighttime. His new wife was able to alibi him for that night, so he was not a suspect. Meanwhile, at the morgue, the medical examiners carefully assess the state of Elena's body. When they get her, she's fully clothed. She was in her clothes, but they weren't exactly in order. Her socks were pulled up so that the heels were almost completely out of her shoe. It appeared almost as if someone had redressed her. But it is the damage to the body that is most distressing. There was bruising on her face. There was obviously bruising around the neck where she'd been strangled. There was bruising in the abdomen area. Suggesting the victim had been lying down and the killer on top of her. And it could have been from him propping himself up in order to get a better grip to strangle her to death. Had he left any clues to his identity behind? At the autopsy, they did swabs of her neck, hoping to find the DNA of the person who had put his hands around her neck to kill her. There are scrapings made for the contents underneath her fingernails. If she were to have scratched somebody, we may be able to pull up their DNA from the cells that she had trapped underneath her fingernails. Forensics expert Jody Sass carefully examines the samples. Unfortunately, in this particular case, there was no male DNA there. Sass does find evidence that someone had sex with Elena prior to her death, but she can't secure a full DNA profile. Sione Louis stated they hadn't had sexual relations for weeks. So had Elena's killer also been a sexual predator? The underpants that she had on had been pulled up and ripped. Her sweatshirt had underneath it a bra that was balled up and stuffed up under the front. It was not on her. Anytime someone's body is recovered in a vehicle and it looked like possibly she had been redressed, that we look at sex offenders in the area. But it is a look into Elena's suitcase that gives investigators their first piece of the puzzle. The items in the bag were things that no woman would ever bring on a trip with them. Elena Busiakos has been found dead on a cold February night in a Woodenville, Washington parking lot. It was pretty traumatic, I mean, for all of us, you know, and especially being found in the trunk of your car is hard to digest. I was heartbroken. I mean, I was genuinely heartbroken. The possibility that the killer's motive was robbery is looking less and less likely. Somebody that had robbed her, that had taken her credit cards and her money, probably would have used them. And there is still no sign of Elena's missing engagement ring. Someone would try to get rid of it in some fashion, likely try to pawn it would be a logical place to look, and there was nothing like that. So who had taken her life and why? Detective Peters can't help but return to images of the crime scene, convinced they're the key to the killer's identity. We looked inside her suitcase and there was a pair of running tennis shoes, which seemed odd to me because, you know, she is found wearing tennis shoes and she was only gonna be gone for a couple of days. Usually you pack smart and only bring one pair of tennis shoes. Elena also had two pairs of boots, two hair dryers, and too much luggage for a weekend away. The first thing that was found was her suitcase, which she had packed for the trip. It had been neatly packed, the items were folded, and then there was also a bag in her car where makeup items were thrown. So that seemed a little out of place for the type of girl Elena was. The items in the bag were things that no woman would ever bring on a trip with them. There was a big, tall bottle of suave hand lotion when she had a perfumed lotion in her suitcase. That's what she meant to take with her. There was a hair gel bottle with no lid on it. Nobody would take these toiletry items. 
So who had packed Elena's luggage? The killer clearly had access to her belongings. Detectives looked more closely at Elena's fiance, Sione Louie. We found out that the relationship wasn't what Sione Louie was presenting to us. He had said, you know, they were going to be married and they're in love and they have a great relationship. And in fact, Elena's people were telling us, no, she was ending the relationship. I said, are you still wearing the ring? And she said, well, yeah, I'm still wearing the ring, but I'm not planning the wedding. She was scared of marrying him because she couldn't trust him. With good reason. He was married when he met her, and she didn't know it. She had found, at some point, a wedding picture of Sione and his past wife, and they weren't divorced yet. She had no idea he was married. None. Zero zilch. That was the first sign of this wasn't maybe the most honest man on the world. The first sign, but not the last. Sione hit on other women while he and Elena were together. Even Elena's friends. During the dinner at the Christmas party, I was sitting next to him, and he put his hand on my lap. I was with my date, and he was with Elena. We had all gone out one night, and he grabs me, and he tries to kiss me. I was like, this is so completely awkward and weird. Jacqueline tells Elena what happened. She was so sad, obviously. But I think she wasn't that completely shocked. I think she was starting to figure out who, who this person was. But only days before Elena's death, she made an even worse discovery. Sione was in a relationship during that time period with another lady. There were a lot of things that she didn't know about what he was doing, that he was sort of living a double life with regard to other women. She'd finally, the day before she had passed away, gotten together with the woman he was having an affair with. They had discussed you know, what type of person Sione was. This woman was going to call Sione on his cell phone. And when Sione answered and started speaking with her, Elena then got on the phone and said, basically, you know, you're lying to me. And basically, she busted him out. Elena told the woman she had come to a decision. Either he was going to be moving out, or I'm going to be moving out. She realized that she couldn't do this any longer. We find out that she had closed out her account with Sione, which was a joint account, uh, on Friday, the day before she was to fly to California. But even if Elena had called off the wedding, would Sione have retaliated with murder? In their effort to find out, detectives call in the hounds. It was a shot in the dark, but what the heck. Investigators have learned that in the days prior to her murder, victim Elena Busiakos had made plans to leave her fiance, Sione Louie. She was a strong girl. She wasn't this timid person. She was done. And so she said, I'm done. I think he lost it. The mild-mannered boyfriend isn't who he seems to be. He would played rugby, and he was a really, really good rugby player. And he had almost killed a man on the field, like literally almost killed the guy. He had to go. I think he was in critical condition. And there's more. Well, we had heard that he had assaulted a prior individual in his life, female. And Sione had become increasingly controlling with Elena. He was obsessed with her. It was not a healthy love in any way, shape, or form. Sione was very possessive of his past women and Elena as well. And one of his patterns was to call Elena probably too much. When we would go out to lunch, an hour lunch, he would call her 30 times. She'd have to turn off her phone. But after Elena failed to show up in California, Sione didn't call her cell phone even once. There was no calling to her. There was nothing. It was like complete silence after she left. And the latest lab results raise more suspicions. Sione Louie was interviewed by detectives, and he denied any sexual contact with Elena. And in fact, uh, the underpants that were recovered on Elena had Sione's DNA. So that was another red flag that he hadn't actually been truthful to us. The more detectives hone in on Sione, the more red flags pop up. 
For example, there was a rental car coupon on the refrigerator that Elena planned to use in California. If she had left, as she planned, she would have taken that coupon with her, but she didn't. Detectives looked at Sioni's computer, and there was a search on there, Woodenville murder, before he even reported her missing. There was a pair of pajamas that he pointed out to the police. They were leopard print. Her friend said, no, no, no. Elena would never wear those to bed. She wore sweats and a t-shirt. When you pick up the pajamas, they're creased. They've clearly never been worn, never been unfolded. The bottom of Elena's shoes, her tennis shoes, were quite clean. There's mud and muck that goes from between their door to where the car was parked. How did she get from her house to her car with her tennis shoes almost completely clean? I'm sure if she was telling him that night that the relationship is over, one of them is going to be moving out, that he just exploded and was violent with her. Did a frightened Sione then dress Elena and carry her dead body to the car? She had clearly been laid in the trunk. She wasn't tossed in. Her arms and legs were not out of position. Heartbreaking details that reveal Elena's attacker had once cared for her. Sione Louis fits that bill. Detectives came to the conclusion that he was the one and only suspect in her case. But prosecutor Kristen Richardson knows they have no irrefutable physical evidence of Sioni's guilt. You have to build a mountain of evidence from a million little pieces that puts you over the top beyond a reasonable doubt. They need more to put Sioni behind bars, and Richardson has an idea. This car is within a half a mile of the house. Had Sioni driven Elena's car to the parking lot, then walked back home? And if so, would his scent trail still be there? I just thought, what the heck? I'm going to call my bloodhound friend, Richard. Richard Shurman, a dog handler with Seattle Search and Rescue. I received a call from Christian Richardson requesting my input on whether a bloodhound could run a trail on a crime scene that was somewhat old. Sherman is skeptical. It's been almost two weeks since the murder. When the scent gets over about three days old, particularly in urban areas, it uh, degrades and it becomes very difficult. And only the most spectacular of dogs can follow those kinds of trails. Is this dog one of them? The original case detective got an item of clothing from Elena's house, which belonged to Sioni. The team places a bag containing an article of Sioni's in the same spot where Elena's body was found. I allow the dog to just meander up to the scent article out of curiosity, and they naturally take the scent, and then I give them a command of find. And as soon as the dog hit on that scent, she was off in a flash. Tail went up, the, the head went down, totally focused, nose to the pavement. For two hours, the dog follows the scent past shops to a condo complex and onto a main road. You have to be very patient, and you just follow the dog and trust him. We walked maybe a, an eighth of a mile, quarter of a mile at the most, up the road, and the dog stopped and immediately made a right turn up a blind driveway. There's no markings there. There's no indication of who lives there or even what the address is. But the hound is confident of her destination. As it turned out, she walks up in front of this memorial on the porch of the house. Sioni's scent had led the dog all the way from the crime scene to Sioni's own front door. There were other police officers standing around, just with <laughs> some of their mouths open. They couldn't believe it. It was just amazing, really. So had Sioni dumped Elena's body in the parking lot, then walked home? Or could he have innocently passed through on foot in the days following her murder? There must be no doubt in a jury's mind which one is true. Circumstantial evidence uh, cases are very scary in terms of whether we can win them or not. The danger is that he can never be tried again because of double jeopardy. So we get a one shot at it, and if he's not guilty, he's free forever. We're looking at the evidence again and uh, trying to see if there's any other items we can send to the lab. But in their search for something to strengthen their case, investigators find evidence that could tear it apart. That speck of blood was a problem. 
Police are on the trail, quite literally, of Sione Louie. A trained bloodhound has tracked his scent from the parking lot where Elena's body was dumped to the home she shared with Sione. It was clear that the grieving husband-to-be that he was playing wasn't quite true. But the prosecutor lacks sufficient evidence to lay charges, so Louis remains a free man. Then just three months after Elena's death, her friend Heidi gets a surprising call. They passed the phone call to me and said, it's Sione. He said, I have a pantsuit that belonged to Elena that she always wanted you to have if anything should ever happen to her. She's never given me clothes. We're not the same size even remotely. Heidi, who's 5'9", was immediately suspicious that 5'4", Elena, would give her a pantsuit as a dying wish. I called the cops. <laughs> I called Sue Peters, and she said, OK, this doesn't really add up, but let's, if you're willing, um, let's set up a meeting. Detective Peters also offers a word of advice. It would be smart if you don't leave the building at night by yourself. Felt really creepy, really, really creepy. But I'm thinking this guy is super guilty, and we need to figure out a way to catch him. So we set up a wire order. My office was bugged, basically. There was a hidden camera, and there was a little clock radio that had a little hidden camera. There was a lot of high-tech James Bond stuff going on in my office. We observed Sione Louie coming to her business. Hello. Hi, how are you? How are you? Good. Your emotions are going all over, like fireworks. He sat down in front of her at her desk and brought a pantsuit. He was standing in the closet, and I didn't have any people out there like that for it. Detectives had given me a list of questions that they wanted asked. You know, where were you? How did you feel? You know, I was actually out of town, um, but I knew that they found the car. Well, that, what happened there? They found the, the car a week later. They mm -hmm. found the car at uh, Wooden Mill, I think. So they never left Wooden Sione shows no emotion when talking about Elena's murder. Oh, I know. He didn't say anything that a husband who lost his wife to murder should say. Within minutes, Sione's real intentions become clear. He was really? Yeah. He was there to see if I was single. His plan was to ask her out. <laughs> and when she tells him she's already in a relationship. So was Danny. Yes, yeah, I remember. Yeah. Good, good guy. Yep. Well. He was like, okay, well, good to see you. And he was done, gone. I felt like a thousand ants are crawling all over my body. It was, ugh. Though the encounter reveals Sione's callousness, it isn't proof that he's the killer. I'm reviewing records upon records upon records and trying to piece it together and decide with other people from my office, is this chargeable or not? Well, you just you want to make sure you have enough to go to court and win the case. And Detective Peters has just discovered something she hopes will help them do that. I found a small speck of blood on the gear shift boot. Is it Sione's blood? Could he have cut himself in the course of Elena's murder? I extracted it for DNA and got a male profile from that. Unfortunately for the prosecution, this unidentified blood is not Sione's. It's not Elena's. Easiest thing to argue for the defense attorney, it's the man who killed her. And until I felt like we had enough evidence to overcome that speck of blood, there was not going to be a case filed. For the next five years, it seems like Sione Louie may well get away with murder. You watch Law and & Order, and it's solved in an hour. And I mean, I knew it wasn't going to be like that, but it was so frustrating. And you know that a murder suspect has been identified, and he's out living a normal life. And what if Sione Louie kills again? He had a violent streak. He definitely proven that he, he, he was violent. Though the case goes dormant, the investigators are determined not to let it go. I felt over the years like Elena was sort of with me looking at the evidence and just going, come on, 
come on, you're almost there. I felt that way. All your unsolved cases are with you, basically until they're solved. I'll never give up on a case, and I'll hunt you down to the end. In 2006, Sue Peters reviews the case yet again, this time with her new partner, Detective Christina Bartlett. What stands out to me is, is going to be different for another detective. Bartlett pours through the files and photographs in search of anything that might have been overlooked. That's when she notices Elena's laces. She has running shoes on. The laces are tied off to one side. One was on the inside and one was on the outside, which isn't a normal way to tie your shoes. Clearly, she had been laying down when the shoes were tied. Had her shoes been tied by her killer? I had actually contacted Elena's family. We, I think, received about four or five photographs. The knot and the bow tie is centrally located on the tongue of the shoe. We decided to send her tennis shoes to the lab to be looked at for DNA. So I collected a sample from the shoelaces. I then extracted the swab sample I collected for DNA analysis. And what I got was a mixed sample of Elena and a trace male component. To be able to further identify who that particular individual might be, we needed a more sensitive technology for male DNA. They submit the sample for the specialized testing, knowing all too well it will take time. We live in a CSI world. You know, life is not like that. We can never get DNA in 45 minutes, solve a murder, have a conviction, and on to the next homicide. The investigators know that in the real world, those laces may be their last best chance to put Sioni behind bars. We know whoever killed her tied those laces. Detectives are heating up the five-year-old cold case of Elena Busiakos, slain, they believe, by her fiance, Sione Louie. He was the only person possible that could have murdered her. But proving that is proving tough. There's moments where you think this case is never going to be a solvable, fileable murder. While detectives wait for the final DNA results on Elena's shoelaces, they focus in on a phone call Sione made to his sister in Hawaii. For some reason, he found it necessary to call her at 1.15 in the morning on the night that Elena disappeared. The question, you know, begs to be answered. Why, why did you make that call? Were you in a panic? Did something bad happen? And Sione's explanation to that call was he was sleeping on the couch. It was a misdial. He must have rolled over and it dialed his sister. She too had been evasive about that late night call. She had been interviewed by Hawaii police. We needed to see her eyeball to eyeball. Bartlett and Richardson hop a plane to Hawaii. We catch her by surprise. I mean, we show up on the doorstep of her work to interview her totally unannounced. Her interview is in support of her brother. In spite of that, these little details keep coming out. Details like her reaction to the news that Elena was missing. She had asked her brother, are you involved in the death? What the heck kind of question is that for a sister to ask? Sione maintained he was innocent. Nonetheless, when his sister arrived in Seattle to lend him her support. She said she did her own investigation throughout the house. She walked throughout, looking for signs of a struggle or any sort of person being hurt. Though she found no evidence of foul play. It tells me that there is some suspicion that somehow her brother has something to do with their death. Back in Seattle, test results from Elena's shoelaces have finally arrived from the lab. Will they further implicate Sione Louie? The outside lab was able to narrow it down, and Sione was the major contributor to the DNA on the laces. The more time that passes, the stronger the case gets, because we keep adding little pieces of evidence from week to week or month to month. Ultimately, that's what this case is built on, is a mound of circumstantial evidence. But do they have enough to convict Louis? The detectives pay him what appears to be an innocent visit. 
I want to be able to clear you. I have been working this case for a little while, and I have a couple of suspects that I'm looking at. Does Sione ask anything about who did it, how it happened, where she was killed, why she was killed? He asks not one question about that. That was very telling. To their surprise, Louis agrees to come to the police station to talk. He thought he was smarter than us and that he was fooling everyone because time had gone on and nobody had been in contact with him. So I don't think he knew what we had up our sleeve. First, they locked down Sione's story. Every time he lies, you know, we just check it off. There's another lie, there's another lie. Then they launch into some pointed questions. He said that he never tied Elena's shoes. Is that correct? Elena's shoes? Yeah. You tie your girlfriend's tennis shoes? Yes or no? No. You never pick them up and move them? Nope, I never did that. Which, for me, is golden. Sue Peters hones in on the night of the murder. You know when someone causes someone's death and they put them in the trunk of a car? That person has to be redressed. My partner is a bulldog. And, you know, ultimately we go after him and she, you know, she really goes after him. We know something happened between you two. We know that you caused her death that night. Your DNA is on her shoelaces when you redressed her that night. He was definitely nervous and uh, his hands were shaking. You're basically telling me that I killed Elena. I'm asking you because it looks like you did. We're confronting him with all of these facts that he's lying about. One of the comments he made was, we are highly in love. That's a, really a false statement. Yeah, we were highly in love. We had our issues, but we didn't, we didn't split up. She closed her account. She wasn't coming back. What do you say about that? I'm not quite sure what you're talking about. I'm not quite understanding what you're, what you're really saying. How about this? I'm saying that you killed her. How about that? I can honestly tell you that I had nothing to do with Lynn. There was nothing happened that night with us. There was no fighting. There was nothing going on. Some individuals, after speaking with them multiple times, you know they will probably never confess. Well, you always hope for a confession. It doesn't happen very often. But that won't stop them from finally making their move. Kristen was willing to no longer let this sit on the shelf. We needed to do it, and the time had come. We're going to roll the dice. On Friday, the 13th of April, 2007, outside Sione Louis' home. We had a group on surveillance. He drives up, and we arrest him. To finally put cuffs on him and put him in the back of a patrol car, and, you know, you're caught. That was a happy moment. Definitely. The detectives question Sione's new wife. She's not wanting to talk. I let her take out quite a bit of aggression and get the questions in where I can. She is the type of woman that stuck behind her husband. Whatever he said or whatever he did, uh, he could not possibly have murdered Elena. That's when a crucial piece of evidence catches the eagle eye of Sue Peters. Right then, the bells and whistles are starting to go off in my head. It's almost like a smoking gun. After five long years, investigators have finally arrested Sione Louie for the murder of his fiance. We were 100% sure that we had the right person. There isn't anybody else that could have done this. But will their circumstantial case be enough to convict him? Then, during the investigator's interview with Sione's new wife... Sue, who has eagle eyes about everything that's potential evidence, happened to notice his new wife's diamond ring. I asked her, was she with Sione when he picked out your wedding ring? And she said, no, she wasn't. Celeste tells us, oh, I think he bought my ring from a pawn shop. And then right then, the bells and whistles are starting to go off in my head, and I'm going, Oh my gosh, don't tell me he gave her Elena's ring. The ring missing from Elena's body and thought perhaps stolen by her ruthless killer. 
It was one of those pieces of the puzzle that was building the monster that Sione Louie really is. This guy has told us over and over again that he never saw Elena's ring, he never found it in the house, and now he has given it to his new wife. She agrees to let us photograph her ring. Armed with the photo, Detective Peters digs up an old piece of evidence. In Elena's glove box, there were miscellaneous documents, and I noted one was a receipt for some type of ring. It provides Peters with a detailed description of Elena's engagement ring, but is it the same make and model that Sioni's wife now wears? Sue Peters heads to the jewelry store to find out. I may have went over the speed limit a little bit. Peters waits with bated breath to see the ring. The ring at their store matched the ring in the photograph, which was Sioni's new wife's ring. So I remember sitting at my desk and Sue calling me giddy with euphoria, saying, it's the same ring, it's the same ring. It was very exciting. It was a good feeling to remove that ring from her finger. I felt like this was the last thing we really needed to get a conviction. A year later, the trial of Sione Louie gets underway in a Seattle courtroom. I quit my job and I went to the trial every single day and it really affected me emotionally and so I told everybody that I'm going to be completely fine once this man is held accountable. We felt like we had a really strong circumstantial case but it also was the kind of case that we could lose. Will the prosecutor's mountain of evidence be enough to convince the jury? She was only a mile from her residence. They bring out a bloodhound, got an item of clothing which belonged to Sioni. The dog tracks from the car to the house, the way she was dressed. The shoes, I think, were big. The DNA on that. The duplicates of the things that have been packed. And then there were little things. All of the many lies that Sioni Louie told us. He was cheating on her, screwing around on her. And then there is the ring. The ring was the icing on the cake. As for the mysterious speck of blood on the gear shift. It was matched to a mechanic that had worked on her car previously. While the evidence points to Sioni as Elena's murderer, what was his motive? Sioni killed her because she was going to leave him. He told her friend, I can't live without Elena. He told Christina Bartlett, she was killed by someone who couldn't live without her. On April 24, 2008, the jury deliberates for less than three hours. That's unheard of in a circumstantial case, and it's a bad sign. I was literally holding my breath, literally holding it. Your heart sort of stops, and you never know what's going to happen. And then when they said, guilty, I just screamed. And it was like the biggest rush of relief he finally was going to pay for what he did. He had taken a wonderful mother away from her son and a daughter away from her parents and a sister away from her sisters and a friend away from her friend. Sione Louie is sentenced to 16 years in prison. It was a great day when the jury convicted him. The jury put all the pieces of this puzzle together, and his time was up. There's a huge sense of gratification and satisfaction and happiness that we were able to speak for her. You become her voice. The world now knows what happened to her. He took Elena's freedom away. It's his turn to be locked up, and rightly so. A vulnerable grandmother brutally attacked in her own home. She's been murdered. A six-year-old eyewitness identifies the killer. He was the person who did this. The man is convicted and sentenced to life in prison. It was just an offensive crime committed against two very vulnerable people. But one woman is convinced he's innocent. He did not do this. She's not a lawyer. She's not a cop. She's the daughter of the murdered woman the wife of the accused. How can that be? What the heck is going on here?
Barberton, Ohio, just outside Akron, is named the Magic City. But with a population of less than 30,000, it has small town America written all over it. And this is the town where 58-year-old Judy Johnson raised her two daughters, Melinda and April. My mother, Judy, she'd give you a shirt off her back if, if you needed her help. She was very loving and caring. She was kooky, funny, had a temper. But Judy was not lucky in love. Several troubled marriages culminated in a permanent injury. She suffered a lot of domestic abuse. And this one particular time, it actually caused her to lose her eyesight. She was beaten severely. And she only regained a little bit of sight in her left eye, but she had absolutely none in her right eye. And Judy's relationship struggles had a profound impact on both of her daughters. She um, would say to me, you are a good person. You are beautiful. Don't live like I lived. At age 18, Melinda married high school sweetheart Clarence Elkins. I thought this is my chance to create the life that I wanted to live. Marriage, family, children, stability. 17 years later, Melinda's marriage to Clarence has given her two teenage sons and a flood of second thoughts. You know, there was a lot of red flags that I didn't see in the beginning. Red flags that Judy Johnson spoke about freely. My mom did not hold back on what she thought. She didn't feel as if Clarence was really giving that 100%, and she couldn't stand that. My mother, Judy, wanted nothing more than my sister to leave Clarence. April was also raising a family. In 1991, she gave birth to daughter Brooke. Brooke was the only granddaughter. My mom had all grandsons, so it was really special when Brooke was born. They had a bond like no other. They were always together. On June 6, 1998, six-year-old Brooke is spending the night at Judy's house for the last time. While Brooke sleeps in the only bedroom, Judy has gone to bed on the living room sofa. Just hours before daybreak, someone enters the tiny one-bedroom house. She tries in vain to fend off the attacker. But Judy Johnson is beaten to death. Young Brooke is awakened by the noise. When she sees the intruder, she runs back to bed and hides, hoping he won't find her. But she's not so lucky. Incredibly, six-year-old Brooke, who was left for dead, survives the attack. When I woke up, I went to the bathroom and grabbed one of my grandma's robes. I tried to wake her up, and she wouldn't wake up. I couldn't find the phone, so I went and pressed the page button, and I heard it outside. Brooke retrieves the phone and calls the house of a friend, but gets only the answering machine. I'm trying to hear this, but my grandma died, and I need somebody to get my mom for me. I'm all alone. Moments later, Brooke staggers to the home of Judy's next door neighbor. She's my grandma's neighbor for a long time. I played with her kids almost every day. The neighbor, Tanya Brazil, answers the door. I asked her, Can you take me home? My grandma's dead. A mile and a half away, Brooke's parents are still asleep. I heard this tremendous banging, and I knew it was early, so I immediately looked at the clock. I went downstairs, and I met Brooke at the door. I don't really remember the ride to my house. It was just a big blur to me. Tanya let Brooke in, and she left. 
That's when Brooke told me that my mom was laying in front of the couch, stabbed, and that she was dead. I woke up my husband, and I told him that Brooke was here, and she was covered in blood, and that something was wrong with my mom. He immediately gets up and told me to wait there, that he would send the cops to the house if something was wrong. Okay, sir, just calm down. My mother-in-law's been stabbed. She's laying here on the floor. She's dead. 40 miles away in the rural community of Magnolia, Judy's other daughter, Melinda, is just waking up. Her husband, Clarence, is with her. We heard a car flying up the driveway. We had a pretty long driveway. And this Carroll County Sheriff deputy came through the front door and he asked me um, to step outside, my son Brandon and I. Then he asked me what my mother's name was. And I said, Judy. And I said to him, is my mom okay? And he said, no, <laughs> she's been murdered. They had gotten a call from Barberton Police Department that my mom had been stabbed in her home and that Brooke was saying that Clarence did it. Six-year-old Brooke has identified Melinda's husband as the assailant. I asked Brooke who did this, and she told me Clarence, and I said, Clarence who? She said, Uncle Clarence. Uncle Clarence, the son-in-law Judy Johnson had it in for. Elkins is taken into custody and charged with the crimes. When word circulated as to what happened to Mrs. Johnson and to Brooke, the community was alarmed. It was a disturbing, hideous crime committed against two very vulnerable people. It was certainly a daunting investigation that this small town police department was about to undertake. Is Clarence Elkins the sadistic killer? He did not do this. How could you stick up for someone that just killed your mother? Or is the real murderer still at large? This was a killer who was totally out of control. Six-year-old Brooke Sutton has witnessed the brutal beating that killed her grandmother. She's also attacked, but miraculously survives. I need somebody to get my mom for me. I'm all alone. At Akron's Children's Hospital, Brooke is treated for her injuries and interviewed by police and social workers. She tells them what she told her mother, that the attacker was her uncle Clarence, the murder victim's son-in-law. What the police had was a young child who was supposed to be killed but survived. She's an eyewitness to a crime and identify her uncle. She's seen the face often throughout her entire life. Clarence Elkins is arrested and charged with Judy Johnson's murder and the attack on Brooke. Police turn the Elkins home inside out in search of evidence, but find nothing. There wasn't any physical evidence that linked Clarence to the crime scene because he did not do this. But police doubt Clarence's alibi. We had an argument on Saturday evening. He ended up leaving and uh, going to a couple of bars. He got home approximately 2.40 in the morning. The testimony of the coroner was that the, the murder took place sometime between 2.30 and 5.30. Had Clarence gone out again, this time to settle the score with his mother-in-law? The theory is that he was drunk that night, became angry, stewing about this meddling in his life and his marriage. Police theorized that Clarence Elkins, who drove 40 miles with the intention of murdering his mother-in-law and silencing her once and for all. The police felt that he somehow left in the middle of the night, and I didn't hear him. But during the night, I had actually laid down in the living room on the couch because my son Brandon was sick. The car was right outside of the living room window. We had a long driveway, so you could hear if a car was coming up or leaving. Could it be done? Certainly it could be done. There was a narrow time frame where he could go in there and commit the crimes and get back home in time to be seen by Melinda. The police had an eyewitness, and it was a solid case from their perspective. 
While Clarence awaits trial, Barberton detectives hit the streets to carry out their investigation. You had a situation where it's a small police department where murders are not common. Basically, what they're going to do is take the eyewitness account and build their case around that. Detectives interview Judy Johnson's acquaintances, and several of them are subpoenaed. But Melinda Elkins, Judy's eldest daughter, is convinced that her young niece is mistaken. I was 150% sure that Clarence was innocent of my mother's murder and attack on my niece. I just felt that she was very confused about what had happened. But Melinda Elkins is alone in this belief, and taking a stand for her husband's innocence bears a heavy cost. My entire family at that point felt that Clarence was guilty. There's no ifs, ands, or buts on their part. I thought, how could you dare stick up for someone that just killed your mother, our mother? Brooke was not the type of child that would make up a lie like that or even think of a lie like that. The interpretation in the community and the media was that you had a, a woman here who was standing by her man at the expense of her own mother. In May of 1999, 11 months after his arrest, Clarence goes to trial for the murder of Judy Johnson and the assault on Brooke Sutton. But because she's a defense witness, Melinda is barred from entering the courtroom. I was frustrated, devastated, that I was not allowed in there. This is a trial about my mother's murder. Uh, Clarence is on trial for his life, and I'm sitting out in a hallway by myself. Inside the courtroom, witnesses for the prosecution paint a sinister picture of Clarence Elkins prosecution was portraying that this is a nasty relationship between Judy Johnson and Clarence Elkins, that she was a meddling mother-in-law, he had had enough with her, and he wanted her gone. But the most compelling aspect of the prosecution's case is their star witness, then seven-year-old Brooke Sutton. The prosecutor asked me, have I seen the guy that killed my grandma? And I said, yes. And I pointed out my uncle. Clarence's defense team questioned Brooke's reliability. But it's just, I think for a jurist, it's just very hard to overcome the fact that a young girl is pointing a finger and identifying her uncle Clarence as the killer. The trial lasts just three weeks, and the jury deliberations a single day. The jury came back with their decision. They found him guilty of murder, and every count against him they found him guilty of after that. And I just collapsed. Clarence Elkins is handed down multiple life sentences and is not eligible for parole until 2054. I turned around and I looked at April and I said, you know he didn't do this. In my head, I could not understand how my sister was sticking up for him. It was over after that point. The big loser in all this was Melinda Elkins. She had lost her entire family support system based on the position that she took during this trial that her husband was innocent. Scorned by the public, the press, and her own family, Melinda is left to raise her two sons alone. But she refuses to accept the court's ruling. She files appeal after appeal and petitions the Ohio Supreme Court to review the case. Melinda Elkins was up against the state of Ohio. Um, 99 out of 100 murder convictions stand. Every legal appeal is denied. At rock bottom, she has one idea left. Find the killer myself. Melinda's plan? To lure in the most dangerous suspects using herself as the bait. At the gravesite of her murdered mother, Melinda Elkins makes a solemn vow. I said to her, I promise you, I will find out who did this to you if it takes me the rest of my life. And with her husband in prison and authorities no longer investigating the murder, Melinda is determined to solve it herself. 
I had no experience investigating a homicide, obviously, but anyone could have done a lot better than what Barberton Police Department did. Taking her inspiration from a true crime television show, Melinda decides she'll solve the murder using what was then a brand new forensic science, DNA analysis. It was miraculous to me how if you just touch something, you can leave behind your DNA marker and that can be tested to figure out who you are. And I knew that that was something I was gonna have to implement into finding out who did this. I started creating a suspect list. People that had some type of dealing with my mom with any past of violent crime, they went on my list. Next, Melinda prepares to go undercover. Her plan, lure in her suspects and steal their DNA. I would find out where they hung out, where they lived, interject myself into their life, and obtain their DNA. I would go to these bars and flirt a little bit and collect their DNA by running my fingers through their hair. A beer bottle or a cigarette butt was good, had saliva. It was a crazy idea, but I did it because I had to do it. Convinced that the murderer is still at large, Melinda and her sons live in constant fear. My sons were keeping watch at night and had themselves armed with whatever they could use as a weapon had someone tried to break into our home. Meanwhile, Melinda's collection of DNA samples grows. My freezer became the storage unit for this DNA. But Melinda's efforts would stop there. She has no idea what to do next. I needed help. Then, five months after her husband is sent to prison, Melinda finds an extraordinary ally. I came across this organization called Truth and Justice, and I sent them an email requesting some kind of help. They emailed me back, and they said, this sounds like a case for Martin Yant. Yant is a former investigative journalist turned private eye. This guy is world renowned for solving wrongful convictions. And I asked him to, you know, talk to me about this case, and uh, he got right back to me. Melinda was a very unusual, compelling character. Her one goal was to prove that Clarence was innocent, but an equal goal was to find out who killed her mother. Yant travels from Columbus to the Barberton area to meet with Melinda. I usually try to go back to square one and see what caused investigators to go in one direction and perhaps see if they ignored other evidence or other avenues. Martin said to me, wow, this case uh, is wrong. There was just simply no real consideration that it was anybody other than Clarence. It's one thing for an emotional family to jump to conclusions. Trained observers and investigators should not jump to conclusions. I felt somebody's listening to me finally. Using a Freedom of Information Act request, Yant obtains copies of the police reports. Uh, I noticed a description of a bloody fingerprint on the door jam. And there was only one door into this very small house. And I said, well, that's pretty likely killer's fingerprints. So I filed a second public records request on the attempts at identifying that fingerprint. And the police chief responded, the bloody fingerprint was destroyed during the process of trying to lift it. At Martin's urging, Melinda returns to her mother's house and searches the bushes where Brooke found the phone. Melinda started digging around that bush, and she found an old rusted sea clamp. We kind of wondered, was that the murder weapon? And that's not the only clue missed by police. Melinda had mentioned they didn't know what happened to their mother's cat. She found the skeleton of a cat with a string of Christmas lights wrapped around its neck. For Yant, the grisly discovery is another indication that someone other than Clarence Elkins committed the murder. 
somebody is really pathological to kill a cat that way. To me, it even made less sense that it would be Clarence. This was a killer who was just totally out of control. Eventually, Yant is able to obtain transcripts of the murder trial and analyze what transpired. The square one, in this case, was Brooke. As I read that testimony, I was struck about how weak her identification was. And under cross-examination, she admitted she never really got a good look at the killer. Everyone seemed to ignore the fact that Brooke had been traumatized. She had been strangled. She had oxygen deprivation. She had a severe blow to the head. And she's a little six-year-old girl. And no one seemed to question that maybe this little girl was confused. Now officially on the case, Martin gives Melinda one of the toughest assignments yet. In order to get access to Brooke, she must end the Cold War between herself and her sister April. I said, we have to try to talk to Brooke and your sister. We have to know how that identification came about and what Brooke thinks now. I didn't have bad feelings against my sister or, or my niece. I just, I was hurt. It's been more than three years since Melinda and her sister have spoken. With Martin Yant at her side, she goes to April's house unannounced. I felt at that point, that's gonna kill me. She turns me away again. It was about three and a half years since I had seen my sister. She first turned away from me, and I thought, oh, gosh. And she immediately turned around and just hugged me and cried. I just broke down, and I just missed her and loved her and was glad that she was there. It was a very emotional moment. I kind of took Brooke aside and explained why we were there. When Martin asks the now nine-year-old Brooke about the murder, he gets much more than he bargained for. Martin asked me if I was sure that Uncle Clarence did it. And I just kind of broke down and said I wasn't sure. She said, I was never really sure. And I said, what? She said, yeah, I said that originally. But then I started having doubts, and I tried to tell the prosecutors. And they kept telling me, no, no, no. We have all this other evidence about Clarence being a bad man. You're doing a good thing helping us send him to prison. I felt, you know, how, how dare they use her and victimize her all over again? How dare they? It confirmed to me that this case had perpetrated an injustice and that a killer was still on the loose. And if Brooke needed any more evidence, her uncle was innocent. I was looking at a picture of my uncle Clarence, and I noticed that he had blue eyes. Brooke said, Mommy, it couldn't have been Uncle Clarence, because the guy that hurt me doesn't have blue eyes. He has brown. Brooke's revelation sends Melinda back to her suspect list. He really fit the profile. The hunt for Judy Johnson's killer is about to heat up. Melinda Elkin's search for suspects in the murder of her mother has had limited success. Three years into her ordeal, Melinda's niece, Brooke Sutton, who witnessed the attack, has confirmed Melinda's suspicion. I kind of took Brooke aside and asked if she was still sure that Uncle Clarence had killed her grandmother. I just broke down and said I wasn't sure. I had kind of come to that conclusion, but to hear her say it was so validating. Now, the chance discovery of a home video may finally lead Melinda to Judy Johnson's killer. A friend of my mom's brought me a wedding video uh, that my mom was in. I noticed this younger guy was very attentive to my mom. And I said, who is that guy? That's Ryle. He had such a crush on your mom. He had asked 
Judy Johnson to go out, even though there was a 30-year age difference. And this was all shortly before the murder, and Judy Johnson said, you got to be kidding. Melinda, Martin, and April search for clues about their new suspect. He was in the neighborhood at the time of the murder. Also, his roommate told me that he had marks all over his back and stuff, and it looked like fingernail scratches. We knew that some kind of weapon had been used to cause the serious injuries to Judy Johnson. And he had apparently been in some altercations, so he started carrying the upper end of a sawed-off cue stick as protection. It was like a club. Yant obtained surveillance video shot by police outside Judy Johnson's funeral. It showed Rob Rush acting very, very nervous. And it did seem to confirm that he had some scratches on his face. With both Melinda and April in tow, Martin Yant goes to Ryle Rush's place of employment to talk to him. We met with him in a small conference room. We explained that his name had come up as being a possible suspect. He just said that he liked my mom and that he wouldn't have hurt her. But he was very nervous. He could not sit still. He actually would not even look at me. We asked if we could get a DNA sample of his saliva to eliminate him. He refused, which certainly just aroused greater suspicion. The next step, petition the court to order Russia's DNA and provide crime scene evidence to compare with it. Melinda hires defense attorney Elizabeth Kelly. After meeting with Melinda, I was convinced that an innocent man had been convicted. But once a person is convicted, all of the previous rights, that is to say proof beyond a reasonable doubt, innocent until proven guilty, is thrown out the window. The burden is on him to prove that he is innocent. And reviewing courts do not take that standard lightly. Targeting the heart of the prosecution's case against Clarence, Elizabeth Kelly videotapes a statement from then nine-year-old Brooke Sutton. Do you think it was Uncle Clarence? At first, yeah. At first, yeah. But do you think so today? No. She basically said that she was mistaken, and it wasn't Uncle Clarence. In May of 2002, nearly four years after the murder, Elizabeth Kelly presents their case to the same judge who tried Clarence Elkins. We submitted with all faith and confidence to the court that it was Ryle Rush, and certainly not Clarence Elkins, who had done this deed. It's kind of an eye-rolling moment. You know, here's this girl is, you know, years later, all of a sudden remembering eye color. The judge didn't believe the recantation. The prosecutors didn't believe it. And frankly, I think a lot of the public was not swayed by Brooks' retelling of the story now. Seven months later, another huge setback for Melinda. Judge John Adams rules Brooks' recantation unreliable and denies the request to order a DNA sample from Rush. It was frustrating. It was heartbreaking. We had to convince a court and we fell short of that. It didn't stop um, Melinda Elkins' efforts at all. I think it only energized her more. Every time the courts would disappoint me, the more pissed off I was, and the more determined I was to prove them wrong. Melinda launches a website to raise awareness for the cause. There was intense public fascination with this case aided by the media. Finally, under pressure from media and the public, prosecutors agree to release crime scene evidence to Melinda for DNA testing. Police are ordered to collect Ryle Rush's DNA. He gives it up voluntarily. Now, the truth could be one lab test away, but Melinda is in for a shock. Here we are, looking like total idiots. And a break in the case that no one saw coming. She said, you won't believe this. Something is up here. Melinda Elkins has obtained the DNA of Ryle Rush, the man she believes murdered her mother. Now I needed somebody who knew what to do with the DNA. 
Our effort at that point was getting some expertise on this revolutionary new technique of DNA testing. Martin Yan pitches Clarence's case to director Mark Godsey at the Ohio Innocence Project. The Ohio Innocence Project follows the same model as the other Innocence Projects, which is a professor supervising law students who roll up their sleeves and dig into cases of people in prison who claim they're innocent, often using DNA testing to see if there's any new evidence that can confirm innocence or guilt. Knowing it's a long shot, Melinda follows up Martin Yant's referral with a call to Mark Godsey at home. At the end of that phone call, he says to me, Melinda, I'm going to put two students on it tomorrow. I was like, the Innocence Project sends DNA found at the crime scene to one of the most advanced crime labs in the world, along with DNA samples from both Ryle Rush and Clarence Elkins. At the time that Clarence's trial went forward, the type of DNA testing that could have been used to prove his innocence didn't exist. Um, but by 2004, a new type of DNA testing called YSTR testing had been developed, which could now let us pull out DNA results previously unattainable. When the DNA from the crime scene is tested, the results are conclusive. The test results come back. They don't match Clarence Elkins. But the same round of tests brings a shocking result. They don't match Royal Rush. What? The new DNA evidence excluding Clarence is presented in court. Throughout their pleadings, they had said, you know, here's your guy. This is the prime suspect. This is who you should have looked at. And, you know, lo and behold, the testing's done, and it excludes Ryle Rush. Here we are, looking like total idiots um, to the prosecutors. And they had a field day with that one. The prosecution argues that the DNA evidence eliminating Clarence Elkins may have been contaminated. It, it became very clear that they were going to concede nothing. Incredibly, the court once again rules against Clarence Elkins, denying him a new trial. What the lead prosecutor didn't seem to, to know or care about is that we weren't going to stop. Armed with the DNA from the crime scene, Melinda goes back on the hunt. The only man whose DNA profile could be on both of those victims on that night in question was the perpetrator. I went back to my suspect list. I went back to all my files. I came across a newspaper article, and this name jumped out at me. The article reports on the sentencing of a convicted pedophile by the name of Earl Mann. I remember receiving a phone call from Melinda. She said, you won't believe this. You remember Tanya Brazil. Tanya, Judy Johnson's neighbor, to whom Brooke ran for help the morning after the murder. Tanya's boyfriend and the father of her children had been convicted of raping his daughters. Man had slipped through the cracks of Melinda's exhaustive investigation until now. There was this light bulb that went off that said, whoa, something is up here. Earl Mann had a history of violent crimes, and he had been incarcerated at some point. But Melinda learned at the time of her mother's murder that Earl Mann was free and in that neighborhood. Melinda looks up Earl Mann's rap sheet on the Ohio Offenders Search website. The charges that I had found on him fit the profile to me of a person who would commit such a crime against the elderly, against young children. So it all started to tie in. I didn't have any question in my mind. This guy is, is it. But the most alarming revelation is yet to come. He said, yeah, I'm a man sitting right over there. Talk about shocking. That was shocking. Melinda Elkins has discovered that a convicted pedophile was living in the house next door to her mother on the night of her murder. The same house six-year-old Brooke Sutton ran to for help. She opened the door and looked really surprised to see me. Melinda's focus is on an unanswered riddle from the morning of the murder. I need somebody to get my mom for me. I'm all alone. Phone records indicate the exact time of Brooke's call for help made moments before knocking on Tanya Brazil's door. 
I asked her, can you take me home? My grandma's dead. Somebody killed her. Tanya neither went to Judy's house nor called the police before taking Brooke home. My mother-in-law's been stabbed. The 911 call made by Brooke's father reveals just how much time is unaccounted for. What's that? She's dead. There was about an hour between Brooke going to Tanya Brazil and getting her home. Why this tremendous gap? You get a bloody little girl saying somebody killed her grandmother and you don't pick up the phone? Leaving her standing on the porch for 45 minutes bloody and disheveled and injured, I knew that Earl Mann was probably in that house. And Tanya didn't want to let Brooke in there. It's, it's spooky to think that, you know, of all the houses in the neighborhood to go to, she chooses the killer's home to seek refuge. Now the events of that morning come into chilling focus. Is that my grandma? By the time they got to her parents' home, it had changed from somebody to Uncle Clarence. How that happened is one of the great mysteries in the case, and I don't think we'll ever know the answer. Me and Tanya, I just can't remember what we talked about. But one thing is certain. Earl Mann has become Melinda's new prime suspect, and getting his DNA could be the toughest challenge yet. Mann is back in prison for a 1999 armed robbery. Then, an uncanny twist of fate. I come to find out that Earl Mann is in the same prison as Clarence. Talk about shocking. That was shocking. I go to visit Clarence. He said, yeah, I know who he is. He's sitting right over there. And uh, he's in the same prison pod with me. I said, this guy is my number one suspect. I'm going after him. Melinda comes up with an idea and an alias, Jay Lee. I wrote him letters um, requesting him to be my pen pal. The whole objective was for him to actually send me a letter back and lick the envelope. If Earl Mann had licked an envelope, the lab would extract his DNA from the adhesive part that he'd licked never got anything back from him. Now, running out of options, Melinda and Clarence come up with a new plan. I, I remember asking Clarence, does he smoke? And he's like, well, yeah, he smokes. You know, everybody in there smokes. The plan, steal a cigarette butt from man without him realizing it and capture his DNA. Earl Mann is a violent man with a, with a horrific temper. Had he known that Clarence was trying to gather evidence against him, certainly would have uh, retaliated. Finally, Clarence has the opportunity. He sees Earl Mann leave a cigarette butt in a clean ashtray. And Earl Mann walked out of the room, and Clarence could pick up the cigarette butt with the clean tissue. Just days later, Mann brutally attacks another prisoner and is immediately transferred. Clarence smuggles the DNA evidence out of the prison in a confidential letter to his attorney. And she mailed it to the lab, and they came up with a result within actually 48 hours of receiving it. I'll never forget the day we got the call. Clarence's attorney says, are you sitting down? The DNA from Earl Mann that Clarence risked his life to get has been tested, and the results are back. Clarence's attorney called me on the phone, and she says, are you sitting down? Yes, why? We have a match. I'll never forget the day we got the call. Um, came back and said, this is the same man whose DNA was found on the crime scene. After all this time, it came down to a cigarette butt to finally identify who murdered my mother. You would think it would be the mystery solved, but the prosecution is not exactly ready to admit defeat at this point. Exonerating Clarence Elkins and reopening the investigation would require more than scientific proof. Clarence Elkins can't be freed immediately. I couldn't wrap my head around that. This time, Mark Godsey isn't taking any chances. Before taking the evidence to Summit County prosecutors, 
he reaches out to an unlikely ally for support, Ohio Attorney General Jim Petro. It would be unprecedented that an attorney general would cooperate. I said, good luck. <laughs> the gamble pays off. About an hour or so later, Mark called me back, said they're willing to look at this. Going through all of the information that we had, my entire criminal justice staff, a staff of felony prosecutors, homicide prosecutors, people who'd been engaged as prosecutors their whole career, we came to the conclusion that there was an injustice and that Clarence Elkins was innocent. Mark Godsey had called me and said, you know, Jim Petro and his staff are on our side. The Ohio Attorney General taking your side, I mean, the, there's no greater credibility there, folks. It was just unbelievable. No other state attorney general has ever come out for a convicted killer in favor of them, ever. And now, the prosecutors can no longer dispute the accuracy of man's DNA sample. Earl Mann was in prison. We had his DNA. So we were able to match that with the DNA that uh, was taken from the cigarette butt. I got a call from the lab with new DNA results, which greatly increased the odds that Earl Mann was a perpetrator. At this point, it went up to something like 1 in 19 million. Jim Petro calls a press conference. They're going to announce that they're just dropping all charges against Clarence and seeking his immediate release. 20 days before Christmas, Melinda Elkins makes the phone call she's been dreaming of for over seven years. You ready to come home? Then get your stuff packed, honey, because you're coming home today. <laughs> what do you think of Melinda's efforts? Melinda is, is, is very courageous and, and, and a strong person, and uh, she never gave up. Based on the DNA evidence, Earl Mann is indicted for the murder of Judy Johnson. No charges are laid against Tanya Brazil. I remember screaming, like, I can't believe that my sister finally found the person who did this. Guilty. She had help, but she's the one that never gave up. Mann is sentenced to life in prison. I think it was unfair and the prosecutors put me in the position that they did. I basically put my uncle in prison, but my uncle Clarence said he didn't blame me. Earl Mann was now convicted, but it was sad because the bottom line is my mom will never be able to come back. My mom's gone. Clarence Elkins would still be in prison today if it wasn't for Melinda. I can't emphasize enough how much I admired her courage and her tenacity. This was a, a team effort, but the person who was at the center of it was Melinda Elkins. He was behind bars, but it still hurts that someone took my grandma away from me. I said to my mom, I promise you, I will find out who did this to you. I made good on that promise. A murder so brutal, it is beyond imagination. There were stab marks to the face. The body was just badly charred. It's beyond uh, explanation. People that torture other human beings are different kind of people. The ruthless killer at large for decades. It seemed like a nightmare. We just didn't know who did it. Spurred on by a mother's anguish, a tenacious detective discovers the key to the crime. All the hair on your whole body stands on end. That dude's evil. But can she bring him to justice before he kills again? He says to her, let the torture begin. I was scared to death. A 45-minute drive from Los Angeles, California, lies the Oceanside community of Sunset Beach. Three things make it remark. That large stretch of sand, the wind is always blowing, and the sunsets are remarkable. For the laid-back residents of Sunset Beach, October 24, 1988 is just another picture-perfect day until someone notices smoke billowing from an apartment building near the main drag. 
Then it became a lot thicker smoke, and he ran over there and called 911. The fire department was very close by. They were there in a hurry. And then they extinguished the fire from outside, and then when it was safe, they made entry into the apartment and to put out the rest of the fire. When they did that, they observed the remains of a charred human being lying on a bed. Horrified, firefighters quickly contact police. We were in our vehicle when we received a page from our supervisor of the Homicide Bureau. The seasoned investigator is surprised by what awaits him as Carney and his forensic team carefully make entry into the apartment. There is a very visceral reaction when you go into a, a homicide scene where there's been an arson. There's the smell, the burnt petroleum products, like from the rugs, carpets, or furniture. And things are melted, and things are destroyed, and things that you would, would normally recognize as clothing might just be a pile of rubble. Making doubly difficult the task of determining what happened here because everything's black and charred and sort of a mess, and you have to look at it a little more carefully or differently. It isn't long before investigators catch sight of their victim. Looking into the bedroom from the hallway, you could see it was uh, completely burnt out, and what appears to be a human being laying on the bed. He was laying crosswise, and the legs from the knees down were hanging off the bed. The body was just badly charred. I mean, just totally. It's beyond uh, explanation. More horrifying still. Looks like a pillow was placed over his face. We didn't see all the damage initially, but once we took the pillow off, then we could see that he was slashed around his neck. The victim had clearly been murdered. Then the apartment set ablaze. A well-planned murderer who doesn't want to get caught would try to cover up a crime scene or destroy it. A closer examination of the body reveals the victim had been stabbed more than 18 times. This was not like self-defense. It was uh, an act of anger. Who was the vicious killer? And what's their connection to the unidentifiable victim? Investigators hope the blood at the scene will provide some answers. When you have stabbing crimes, Obviously, there's going to be blood. And if there's a lot of stabbing, then a lot of blood is shed. And blood's very slippery. Your hand is probably perspiring. And if you don't have a good solid grip, the blade used will turn in your hand and cut yourself. Leaving blood from the murderer behind. The carnage in the area of the bed makes it virtually impossible to identify what blood, if any, belongs to the killer. But what about the rest of the room? Hirose finds a blood-stained towel in the sink in the ensuite bathroom and bags it for analysis, then moves on to the kitchen. Well, there wasn't as much fire damage in the kitchen, so it was easier to see the blood. And you could see it a little bit on the cabinetry and then also on the floor. Have the investigators found what could be a key piece of evidence? Blood left by the killer. It was blood that had fallen with some slight velocity, which tells me someone cut themselves and went to the sink in the kitchen to wash themselves or to put something on it. It didn't seem like it would be the victim, because with all of his slashes around the neck and stab wounds in the body, it would seem more likely that it was somebody else. Hirose carefully collects the samples. If uh, some of the blood that was more of a smear then I'd have to use a swab in order to collect him. There's no doubt in my mind that that was going to be the suspect's blood. But how will investigators determine the identity of his prey? Well, the victims are usually identified through the fingerprints. But because this victim was burned so badly, the hands were not in a condition where fingerprints could be taken. Eventually, we would have to go to the family and find out where he got his dental work done and compared to the corpse. The detectives are deeply concerned by what they learn. There is a possibility that the victim was killed during a drug transaction, gone wrong. 
Investigators are on the gruesome scene of what appears to be a homicide-related arson in Sunset Beach, California. Now based on paperwork found in a room undamaged by the fire, police believe the murdered man is a resident of the apartment. Dental records confirm it. They would positively identify uh, the victim as being Robert Hogan. A popular 29-year-old surfer. He was a, a happy-go-lucky guy. He smiled a lot. Everybody that you talk about Rob or Robbie said he was a nice guy. Injured in a bicycle accident, Robert Haugen got by on unemployment and disability insurance. But his close friend David McEwen recalls Robert was always the life of the party. He had a magnetic personality. He drew people to him. I don't think that there's a person that knew him could say a bad thing about Robert. I really don't. I know I couldn't. And as long as I knew him, I, I, I don't think I ever got mad at him, ever. But someone did. Now it's up to investigators to find out who. We're looking for any evidence that would indicate a motive or anything that would indicate a possible suspect. They take note of what might be an important clue. There didn't appear to be any signs of force entry, that, such as pry marks or forcing of the door. Had Haugen willingly opened the door to his attacker, or did the killer have a key? Through the evidence, we had learned that the apartment was co-occupied by a female. Could this roommate have had a hand in Robert's grisly murder? In cases like this, everybody's a suspect. And then we go through a systematic approach of eliminating them through interviews. The roommate maintained she was at work when the victim was killed, an alibi corroborated by her co-workers. What about McCune? Could he have been involved? They said, I have to ask you this question. Did you kill Robert? I said, are you kidding me? I loved Robert, you know. He was like a brother to me. Every day we talked to each other. Either he'd ride up to my house or I'd go down there, go to the beach. And he called me that day and wanted me to come down and hang out with him, and I couldn't make it. And to this day, I always tell my wife, you know what? Had I been there, maybe there would have been a different turnout. It haunts me from time to time, it really does. And that's not all that haunts him. A few days after Robert's murder, David McCune paid a visit to the burnt out apartment in the hope of finding some closure. You could still see a lot of the splatters of the blood across the walls and the ceiling, and you could tell it was a very violent, violent scene there. And I was just thinking, man, how could somebody do this to Robert? But there was more to Robert Haugen than meets the eye. Based on the evidence that we found in the house, a weighing device used to weigh quantities for drug sales, there was a possibility that Robert was killed during a drug transaction gone wrong. Investigators pour over what little evidence they do have from the scene. We went through his address book that was badly charred and burnt, but partially readable. You can see who he was talking to and calling, and we talked to those people as well. We even, you know, went door to door and asked his neighbors, did you hear anything? What time were you home? You know, did you guys see Robert? What time was he here? You know, was he with anybody? And, you know, and it's probably the same stuff that the police ask him. We were nobody special. We were just wanted to find out what happened to our friend. But no one offers up anything that might help solve the case. In the months following, Tim Carney continues to plug away at the investigation. Let's redo this interview. Let's talk to this person again. And what are we missing? And the pressure to solve the case continues to grow. The mother came to Orange County to meet with me uh, on the case, and she was a very, very sweet, loving woman. His mom was a wonderful person, and it, this just, just broke her heart, just broke her heart. I didn't have much to offer. We had done everything that we possibly could do at that point in time. You know, after a while, for even for a police officer, you got to say, you know what? We have no leads. It's over. Enough's enough. Yeah, it's the unchecked box. It's always with you. You never forget them.
more than a decade goes by. But the passage of time does little to diminish a mother's need for justice. So every October on Robert's birthday, she'd call and say, I don't want my son's murder to be forgotten. And every year, she'd maybe talk to somebody else in the investigation unit. Then, in 2001, it was Sergeant Yvonne Scholl's turn to take the mother's call. I talked to her for probably 15 minutes that day. And when I got off the phone, I felt, wow, something needs to be done with this because here's a mother who is in agony. Scholl pulls the case files and begins to review the evidence. My first thought when looking at the crime scene photos is, wow, somebody was really, really mad at him. The number of stabs and to start his apartment on fire to destroy evidence. The brutal details of the crime seem eerily familiar to show. I knew that there was a double murder in the same area about four years prior to Robert's murder that was involved with drugs. In that case, the bodies of a 25-year-old surfer and his girlfriend were found bound and gagged and in a pool of their own blood. Not only had they lived just doors away from Robert, Crimes happen in broad daylight, drug dealers kill in their house, you know, on the same street, stabbed many times. Was there a serial killer on the loose in Surf City? He is a very sadistic, violent, and evil person. But we don't know who you are. You're a ghost to me right now. In her effort to solve the gruesome murder of Robert Haugen, Sergeant Yvonne Schull is comparing the case to that of a double homicide four years prior. Could we have a serial killer in the area of Sunset Beach? You just can't imagine that it happens so close. And when it does, you know, you have a lot of rage and anger in you, and you want, really want to find out who did it. Determining the answer is a slow and painstaking process. First, you look at the victims. Do they know each other? Can I connect them in any way? The second thing that I did is look at all of their friends. Is there a friend connection? A quest for answers that doesn't stop at the end of the day. When you go home at night, you're thinking about that address book. Your spreadsheet that you made is in your briefcase because you're flipping through it on the coffee table, seeing if something will pop out to you. But months later, I could never find a connecting line between the two cases. And that's frustrating to work all that time and look at the cases and look at the people, but never find something that links them together. Not prepared to give up, Shaw attempts to connect the case to crimes committed elsewhere in the United States using the Violent Criminal Apprehension Program. So I filled out the 44-page case submission booklet and sent it to the FBI in hopes that I could have something match up. Got nothing. No other matches, no other anything in the country that I could pursue. And the sergeant is dreading what's to come. A year had gone by, and Robert Haugen's mother had called me again on Robert's birthday. I mean, it was heartbreaking to talk to her, because she would cry on the phone, and she kept telling me, I think my son is just going to be a statistic. You're trying to maintain your rough, tough investigator composure and tell her to keep the faith. And this time, Yvonne Schull makes a promise she may come to regret. I promise I won't forget, and I will solve this case. With the weight of those words heavy on her shoulders, Schull revisits the Haugen file yet again. So I go through the photographs. I meet with the forensic scientists and say, what can we do? And they tell me, well, we think that we can do some DNA testing. We think that we maybe can get a DNA profile. A profile they hope will lead them to their killer. But 14 years after the murder took place, that's far from certain. You're never sure if you can get DNA because you don't know if the sample's large enough. You don't know if it was collected properly because in 1988, DNA was not on the forefront of science. You basically have your fingers crossed that we have a big enough sample to get something now. In these arson cases, there's just so much 
that's going on. It's very chaotic and there's a lot of visual overload. Sometimes you don't get everything and you can't collect every single drop of blood from a crime scene. The mistakes we make the day of the crime can come back and haunt us in the future and really impact the case in a negative way. To Shull's relief, the sample is sufficient to provide the murderer's DNA, but to her disappointment. I get back that there is what's called a forensic unknown. We have a profile, however, we have no match to it. That means that somebody out there is a murderer, but we don't know who you are. You're a ghost to me right now. A ghost that continues to trouble her long after she moves to another department within the Orange County Police Force. I took the case with me because I couldn't forget it. At that point, I felt that I knew Robert. Yes, I knew that he smoked marijuana, and yes, I knew he sold marijuana, but it didn't matter to me because everyone that I talked to about Robert told me what a nice, nice man he was and that he would give you the shirt off his back. He did not deserve what happened to him. And his fate made worse by the fact his killer walks free. I'm feeling at this point that it's not going to be solved. I don't know if I'm ever going to be able to call Robert's mother and say, I know who did it. And I'm very frustrated at that point. You wake up every day, and, and it was the same thing. No news, no suspects. We're looking at this person. We're looking at that person. We're talking to this guy. It just seemed like it took forever and ever, and there was just nothing. In April 2004, Yvonne Schull returns to the Orange County Homicide Unit. Robert Haugen's case returns with her. And I continued to look at stuff, continued to talk to the forensic scientists, and we're still pretty much nowhere on the case. Well, what they do, and they, what they did in this case, is they call it a murder book. They'd open up the murder book and say, is there anything new in here? Is there anything we forgot? they show it to a new set of detectives. Because I know that it doesn't matter who you are, you don't see everything. And sometimes you just need a fresh set of eyes to look at something. Shull brings on board Sergeant Ray, who, having received death threats during the course of the investigation, continues to fear for his life. It was very difficult because Robert seemed to be such a nice person who had no enemies. And then to look at those crime scene photos and to see the viciousness of this homicide, those two characteristics of this case just did not mix. He's starting to get to know Robert. He's pulling yearbooks from when Robert went to school and looking at people who may be able to provide us with just a speck of something to go forward with. Meanwhile, both officers harbor a growing sense that the killer is someone close to home. If you read books on unsolved murders or you go to classes on unsolved murders, all of them say, go over the case again, go over the case again. The person who did it's name is in the case. You just haven't found it. Sergeant Ray narrows the names down to just one, the woman with whom Robert shared the apartment. Because it was a male-female roommate situation, was there a jealous boyfriend? The sergeant questions her once again. The interview of the roommate was almost identical to the information she had given the original investigators. And to me, that is big because making up a story is a lot harder than telling the truth. Ray and I talk again, what can we do now? And he said, you know, I think we should put the evidence back in to be re-examined because there's a new DNA system called Profiler Plus. Perfect, let's do it. So he submits the evidence for re-examination. But will it find a match? I was sitting in my office, and Ray came to the door and said, I just got this from forensics, and I am on the edge of my seat. Tell me what you got. Hoping to determine the identity of Robert Haugen's killer, investigators have requested more advanced testing on the blood drops found in Haugen's apartment 19 years earlier. And when I found a complete profile that did not match the victim, that's where I felt, OK, now I have something that I can put into the database and see if there's a hit. And it began searching. 
for DNA profiles to see if there's a match. Because Robert's murder was so violent, I'm optimistic that this person has not stopped their criminal ways. And they have been caught, and their DNA has been taken, uploaded into the nationwide database. So we try, and we strike out again. And there are hundreds, if not thousands, of cases on books with that exact circumstance. All they're waiting for is for that one person to make a mistake and get arrested and have their DNA entered in the national database. It's just a total waiting game, and sometimes it could take just a few months, or it could take years or decades more, and that's sometimes the frustrating part of it. Eventually, uh, I had moved away and just kind of put it behind me, but we would try to go to the beach in October and we throw flowers or a wreath of flowers in. I don't know, it was just like a, like I remember you, brother, you know. I, I'm still here and I remember you, you know. It is a sentiment all too familiar to senior deputy district attorney Brahim Baytek. Victims' families never forget about cases because they never forget about their lost loved ones. The investigators in this case never forgot about the case. Three long years later, in January of 2009. I was sitting in my office, and Ray came to the door and said, I just got this from forensics, and I am on the edge of my seat. Tell me what you got. And he said, we got a hit. That match was out of the state of Nevada. So our forensic unknown is identified. Who is it? He says, well, it's Paul Smith. And I go, who's Paul Smith? I had to go back over these case books to try to find that name somewhere, and I didn't find it anywhere. From our perspective, Paul Smith did not exist. We did not know about him. He was never interviewed in 1988. He was never even on the radar. Maybe it's one of those things where if you don't ask the question, you won't get the answer. Once we asked the question, people said, oh, yeah, Paul Smith used to buy marijuana from Robert Haugen. OK. In fact, Paul and Robert had attended this Long Beach High School together. We discovered Paul Smith was a standout varsity wrestler in high school, had received a, a scholarship for Biola University, which is a Christian university. At the time of the murder, Paul Smith was working for a Bible translation company. It's hardly the profile of a cold-blooded killer. He was basically living a, a very normal, average, middle-class type job with the house with the white picket fence, two kids, and, and a dog. I knew him very well, you know. I knew his brother and his family. You know, we were a close-knit group. But having divorced his wife, Paul Smith is living in Las Vegas. And in 2007, he assaults his girlfriend, Tina Smith. The police come and they arrest him. Eventually, he pleads guilty to domestic violence. Part of that scenario, he's required to give a sample of his DNA. The sample that proved a match to the drops of blood found in Robert Haugen's apartment. I wanted to get in the car and drive out there right then and there. But being an investigator, you know you can't just do that. We know that we only have one chance to find out from Paul Smith as to why his blood might be in the apartment. It may not have anything to do with the murder. He may just have his blood there. We don't know why. We start doing a background check on him, and we find out about the 2007 incident involving Tina Smith. And to me, that was very interesting. Their research reveals Smith to be a sadist with a violent history of torturing his girlfriend. She was drawn to him like a moth to a flame. He not only had stabbed her, he had pointed a loaded gun at her and actually discharged the gun, nearly striking her as she was tied up on a bed. But it's an incident eerily similar to Robert Haugen's murder that captures the attention of investigators. He was angry at her, started using a knife on her. He beat her up, doused her in lighter food, and threatened to set her on fire. But the clicker that he was using to set her on fire, click, 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 wouldn't work. That dude's evil. 
People that torture other human beings are different kind of people. The notion of wanting to be sadistic, that's different. That tells you this person belongs in a completely different category of perpetrators. It became like, I can see how torture plays a factor into what happened to Robert Haugen. The crime in our homicide case and the crime against his girlfriend were very violent, involved stabbing, involved a bed. And that made us realize this is a serious suspect that we have here. Cold cases are like giving CPR to an elephant. And you work, and you work, and you work, and you work, and sometimes it never works. And sometimes, at a moment's notice, the elephant is going to jump up and start stampeding because you have breathed life into it. And in February of 2009, Sergeant Ray finally travels to Nevada to interview Paul Smith. We want to try to lock him into a story. Do you have an explanation for why your blood is there? And then, come on, I know you did it. I know you want to tell me. Just get it off your chest. What happened in there? Then why did you get hurt? Sergeant Ray is en route to Las Vegas to meet Paul Smith, the man police believe is Robert Haugen's murderer. We get into the Clark County Jail. When Paul comes into that room, he is extremely nervous, and he is shaking, and he is visibly disturbed. He was a suspect in our mind. However, we wanted to make sure that we are on the right track. You know, we're human beings. Everybody makes mistakes. He said, you're not in trouble, and this is a voluntary thing. We're asking for your help, if you can. We wanted to make him feel comfortable, make him think that this is, to some degree, a routine. We just want to talk to you, see if you can point us in the right direction. Hopefully, there's a tidbit of information that you can give us that you may or may not be able to help us out. Paul Smith seemed eventually kind of eager to talk about how great of a person Robert was. Any enemies you could think of that, you know, would do this? No, no, everybody loved him. Paul Smith even told us that he attended Robert's funeral. I spoke to him. You did? Was his family there and all that? Oh, yeah. It was uh, one of those moments that, like, all the hair on your whole body stands on end, and you're like, I can't believe it. Smith admits to buying marijuana from Robert. But, but for a long time. He was the biggest dealer around. And how often would you go to his house and buy? Pretty regularly. Once a week, twice a week, once a week. Can you do me a favor? Can you do a diagram of maybe just starting the front door and, and go from there? And Paul Smith drew us an accurate diagram of that apartment. So it was apparent to us that Paul Smith knew this apartment and he knew our victim. The day that he died, did you talk to him at all? No. Oh, yeah, I did. Yes, I did. And I told him to save him another bag. Smith says that he planned to pick up that bag of marijuana the day of Robert's murder, but there was a snag. I called him and his phone was out of order. What time did you call him when it was out of order? Do you remember? Uh, one. I... When he said 1 o'clock, it was huge because that was the exact time that witnesses pinpointed when the fire was seen. In an effort to draw out the real story, the sergeant digs deeper. Ever see anyone get in an argument or a fight with him at the apartment? No, that was why it was a shock to everybody pretty much that he was such a nice guy. And, and you and Robert got along. You guys never had any problems? No. And we decided it was time to begin asking Paul Smith about the blood, why we found his blood in the apartment. If there is an innocent explanation, we want to hear it. We want to give him a chance to tell us, hey, look, man, I have nothing to do with it. And Paul Smith said, you didn't find my blood in there. I, I never bled in that apartment. Sergeant Ray figures it's time to set him straight. That's your specimen number, and that's the match. This is science, man. I mean, it doesn't get any more conclusive than DNA. You know about DNA. After Paul looked at that DNA report, he took a few moments, and he seemed to be thinking about it. 
And then he decided to tell us, oh yeah, I remember now, there was that time. I cut my finger right here with a knife the day before playing with it. It's possible. However, why didn't you just tell me that in the beginning? I guess maybe it's just our suspicious nature. We don't believe a word that he said. We believe that he cut himself. We believe he cut himself while he was murdering Robert. I believe something happened between me and Robert. There was some sort of a fight that you guys had. There had to have been a reason for it. Never had a fight with Robert ever. The sergeant decides to cut to the chase. What happened, Paul? I know you want to tell me, OK? Just get it off your chest. What happened in there? Nothing. Then why did you hurt him? I didn't hurt him. Despite Sergeant Ray's best efforts, Paul Smith is unwavering. Even though he didn't break, we were able to get a lot of information from him that was very helpful to us. The prosecutor in Orange County decides that there is enough evidence to charge Paul Smith with murder. I can tell you, for me personally, that was the first time that I filed a case from 20 years ago. Because I think sometimes perpetrators, after a year or two, they think they got away with it. But when you're talking about 20 years, they really thought they got away with it. They really think, I did it. Nobody knows that I did it. They don't have the evidence to come after me, and I'm going to move on. Once we served the arrest warrant on the jail in Las Vegas, I told Ray, let me call Robert's mom. It took me all day to psych myself up to do it. And I said, hello, it's Yvonne Scholl from the Sheriff's Department. Are you sitting down? Today is the day I know who murdered your son, and he's under arrest. And I, again, had my rough, tough investigator persona on so I could not cry. But as soon as Shell gets home. I called my mom to tell her what I did for the day. Then I cried. She said, I knew you could do it. In March of 2009, Paul Smith is extradited from Nevada, and Sergeant Ray has the satisfaction of escorting him back to California to face charges. I can imagine, on one hand, it's rewarding. You know, I, this guy thought he got away with murder, and I'm bringing him back. On another hand, you're in the same car with somebody that you know is an evildoer. He didn't really have a whole lot to say. I think by that time, he realized that he wasn't able to fool the cops. He's in the Orange County Jail held without bail on a, what we call it, a special circumstance of the murder charge. Can't get out. Knowing that his mind is spinning right now, and we're interested to see what he's going to do next as far as reaching out to people. The answer is nothing short of shocking. Hearing that Paul Smith wants me uh, killed was obviously unnerving. To be the person to have put him in that position, I was scared to death. Murder suspect Paul Smith is cooling his heels in a California prison, but the case against him is far from complete. And even after Paul Smith was brought back to Orange County, I continued to do a lot of interviews, including Paul Smith's girlfriend, Tina Smith. And I think that's when Paul Smith went into mode of, I got to make sure people don't tell the police about what I've done, mostly to Tina Smith. When we realized that, we started monitoring all of his correspondence from the jail. We started taping all of his phone calls. I just got a call from a detective. They want to interview me about something you may have been involved in 25 years ago. Oh, with me? Yes. 25 years ago? He says they're investigating a cold case. And I'm the suspect? Something you might have been involved with, I guess. I don't know, babe. I have no idea. His brain is going, you know, 1,700 miles an hour, trying to figure out what can I do to get out of what I did. And I suspect one of the first things that his attorney told him is the DA didn't just file murder charges against you. The DA filed murder charges with a special circumstance of torture because every single stab, every single one of those 18 stabs, Robert Haugen was alive. Which means, in California, he's potentially eligible for the death penalty. Within a matter of weeks... We start to hear rumors from a jailhouse informant 
that Paul Smith is asking around, can you introduce me to somebody who can do my dirty work? He wants to have certain people he has identified to be assaulted or killed. Sergeant Ray is one of them. He was very, very upset with Ray, very, very upset with Ray. And because he's a sociopath and he's selfish, it's never his fault for anything. It's always somebody else's fault. So Paul Smith goes into this, I need to do whatever I can to get rid of Ray. Well, you know, there's over 40 murderers in here, right? Yeah. Well, it turns out I was talking with a few of them. A couple of them are from Orange County. Really? Yeah, and they said they know some people that if charges are filed against me, that they'll go pay somebody a visit and let that person know how much I appreciate them and send a special gift to them, thanking them. Hearing that Paul Smith wants me killed was obviously unnerving. To be the person to have put him in that position, I, I was scared to death. Smith's other target? He's trying to get rid of someone who we're going to bring to court as a witness who will testify against him and say that he committed the crime. If we have no witnesses, we have no case. We wanted to make sure that everything that Paul Smith is doing while he's in custody we know about it, and hopefully we know about it before he does it. Investigators have their jailhouse informant put Smith in touch with Blade, an undercover officer posing as a hitman. So he's talking to Blade, and he's talking to him about, you know, I want to take out Ray. And the concern that I, I have at that moment is, I have control over what he's telling Blade. But what I was worried about is, what if he talks to another inmate at the jail who's willing to help him, who's not going to come and tell us. So we needed to move fast. But the arrangements for the hit on Sergeant Ray are already well underway. Somebody will be contacting you, baby, OK? And then you'll need to go to my bank and withdraw all the rest of the money from my account, OK? OK. All right, because it's not going to do me any good in jail. I'd rather spread the wealth around and the happiness. Okay. Unbelievable. He stabbed her, shot at her, and beat her up and all these things. And she's still doing whatever he wants her to do. Tina Smith's first task is to make certain that Blade, who she too believes to be a real hitman, has the right cop in his sights. She's been interviewed by Ray, so she knows who he is. And so she meets with the undercover operative. The operative says, I'll get you pictures so that we can confirm that this is the person that you want hurt. Then, despite Shull's growing unease. Unfortunately, I have to sit Ray down and say, hey, although your life is in danger, I need you to have some photographs staged and then have our undercover operative meet with Tina and show her the pictures. Hey, Tina, Tina, hey. So that we can confirm that you're the person that they want to hurt. Tina makes a payment. She delivers the, the information. We have her on tape. So we have enough evidence. And we indict both Tina and Paul Smith for the conspiracy to try to take out a police officer by getting her arrested, putting her in custody, that kind of created that separation. She realized, I'm not just getting beaten by him, I'm not just getting tortured by him. Now, I can go to prison for a long time because of him. She agreed through her attorney to now speak to us about Paul Smith and the type of person Paul Smith is. He offered her to Blade. He told the Blade, Hey, look, I have a girlfriend. She's really, really good at giving sexual favors, and I'm trying to be using term. That's not the term that he used. If you want, um, you know, I'll pay you for taking out this witness. Also, I can get her to do certain things for you. Just offers her up, just like that. And as a jury will soon discover, that's just the beginning. I think they might have met at a orgy. You know, bondage and cutting them up. You have no sympathy for people like that. 22 years after the murder of Robert Haugen, the trial of suspect Paul Smith gets underway in an Orange County courtroom. I got as close as I could to the front and just let him know that, you know what, you're never going to be forgiven for this. And if you ever talk to people and they tell you, yes, when I looked in that person's eyes, all I saw was evil, that's what I saw when I looked in Paul Smith's eyes. I think his demeanor was, I'm going to get away with it. 
He's smiling, he's looking back at family members, uh, walking into the courtroom thinking, I'm gonna get to go home by the time we're done. Didn't make me happy when I saw him happy. I wanted maybe him to be miserable for the rest of his life. The trial lasts less than a week, but the courtroom drama will be remembered for a long time to come. Paul Smith took the stand on his own defense, which is very rare. The more he talked, the more bizarre it got. Group sex, sex with animals. I mean, that's um, one of the more staggering things. You never think you're going to hear that in court. The more it became obvious what kind of person he is. And it was an absolutely amazing to watch the prosecutor because the prosecutor brought out Paul Smith's anger streak. So we actually had this thing going on. Was, I'll ask question, he'll talk for about a minute, and then I'll go, are you done? And he goes, yes. I go, then let me ask you the question again. It got to a point where Paul Smith was getting extremely exasperated. And the jury's watching this. Are you done? Are you done? He will talk, 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 and he'll lean forward. He goes, now I'm done. And you see the jurors just go, hmm. I wanted the jury to see what kind of person this is. Court watchers and detectives just shaking their heads, Mike. So why don't we just listen to it? After two days of deliberation, the jury returns with a verdict. I was sitting next to Robert mom and with his family and the court clerk read the verdict the jury found paul smith guilty of murder of stabbing robert to death we all stood up and robert haugen's mom gave me a hug and put her hands on my shoulders and said you never need to prove me wrong again paul smith is sentenced to a life behind bars and he's never ever gonna be a free man again so that was a good feeling that was a rewarding feeling Yvonne Schull and Sergeant Ray received the California Police Officers Award for Best Cold Case Solved. But that doesn't mean they don't still have questions. Unfortunately, we will never know the answer as to why Paul Smith killed Robert. Only Paul Smith knows that answer. Knowing Robert, he would probably forgave Paul. He would have probably forgave Paul. His mom still burns the eternal flame for him, even though Paul Smith is in custody. And she probably always will. And as long as there is a mom somewhere saying, please keep looking at my son's case, please keep looking at my daughter's case, there's going to be an Yvonne, there's going to be a Ray, there's going to be somebody like me who's going to say, we're not going to forget.